Hello everyone, welcome to the next podcast. Today we're discussing sources of necromantic power. And we're here with Jinx. Greetings once again. Seventh Outpost. Hello everyone. And Sidehammer. Hello. So, um, the reason I, I've been wondering about this particular topic is because I've been trying to figure out the limitations of magic for my current game. Like, you know, just like if you have a skeleton, how much weight can it lift? And like, how long can it run before it needs recharging? And like, how is the power stored? And it just got me wondering, like, what do you guys think about that kind of thing? About magical sources and how they get their power. Yeah. So I'm always one for uh, believing that magic can be utilized as a, uh, let's call it a type of battery. Um, they can utilize different sources of magic and it has an actual resource that can be utilized to make it, uh, make it work. Uh, so, like, for example, in the Elder Scrolls universe, they have Magicka, which is a, a fundamental force that's utilized by mages. And that kind of power, I think, when it comes to reanimation... So th there's really there's two kinds, really, of reanimation magic when it comes to what source they use. The first is sort of reanimate and forget types, where you take a certain amount of magic, you throw it into a corpse, it gets up, and then you just tell it what to do. Nothing more really needs to go into it from there. Uh, but there's also the other kind, which is funneling magic. So say you have to like put a certain amount of thought or concentration on whatever it is you've animated. Um, and so that source of magic and energy is constantly going towards them in order to keep them alive. And if that breaks at any point, then they'll drop right back down like a puppet that's not got any strings attached to it anymore. Uh, like the Phantom Menace. Mm -hmm. But like, like it's it's like uh, it either lowers your maximum mana or it's like channeled. Yeah. yeah. So and that, it could that, it could it could screw with your concentration if one little partition of your brain is off into every single one of those pieces of your army. You could start mm -hmm. to lose like uh, the ability to think correctly, maybe. Yeah, and uh, that kind of thing is why, like, that system makes probably the most sense to me for balancing magic systems. Because, like, uh, say you uh, raise an army and uh, you want to have a, a necromancer that's, you know, it's not just overpowered type, so you want them to have actual weaknesses. So the thing with them is that they could raise an entire army, but each one of those reanimations that they've got requires a bit of brain power or a bit of thought. And so having any break in your concentration at any point through the, the actual reanimation process, that's just going to cause parts of your army just to drop dead because you aren't concentrating well enough. And I feel like that's a good way to balance out having an army at one's disposal. I just had a really cool thought. The idea of, like, the army, like, the higher-ups, I just have this, this necromancer, and he's just he's just brain-dead sitting in a chair or lying on a on a cot somewhere and all of his mental faculties are going towards sustaining the army. And they just, he's just being carried around by the, by a bunch of servants and higher ups to put him in place it, for the battle. It reminds me of, it reminds me of Ravenor from the Inquisitor trilogy, but mm. I would like to bring up a bit more, uh, made up points for this, uh, which is namely, what does it mean for things to be balanced? And what are we balancing things by? Mm, uh, that's true. I won't dwell on it very hard. That is I'll true. Try to offer my own uh, like ideas on this. Um, things are balanced, uh, sort of within their own scope. If you have wizards who can just like rain uh, fireballs or uh, me meteorites from the heavens, then uh, a necromancer raising entire armies that can then be destroyed by that meteorite um is is essentially not like it's not going to be unbalanced but a a necromancer able to raise infinite corpses in a place where uh where uh, wizards at best can take like you know one or two or three at a time ends up uh like vastly uh, changing the scale and scope of of what's going on well, you also have to think about it. It's not always in terms of um, combat. 
a, a necromancer who can raise an right. unlimited amount of dead has completely monopolized the market on production, on construction. You know, they have, I mean, what, I mean, if you the thing about the power is, is that where if you're trying to put a limit on how many you can have, I mean, why isn't this necromancer, you know, in control of the entire world just by, you know, farming everyone's food for them, building right. all their right. homes. And, and, and all is, of when you're yeah. designing a uh, setting, th these are always good questions to ask yourself. I think this is uh, the categorical question that people who design uh, settings with magic systems in them uh, fail to ask themselves, it's like, why aren't the wizards running the world? Um, yeah. And the, the answers are very often uh, unsatisfying at best. Yeah. It's true, but the, that's why we, in the, in, the, in the world building of it, we have to create these constraints because otherwise it won't be, you know, plausible. Yeah. Upon reflection, yeah. I feel like Warhammer does this quite well where it has yeah. the power level of things is quite high, but that's combated by the fact that it, most wizards can be driven completely insane uh, just yeah. due to all the magic coming from the realms of chaos. Uh, you know, I have to wonder. It balances it. Yeah. It's like yeah, I have high to risk, wonder. high reward. Yeah, I have to wonder. Does the? I was just thinking about the the winds of magic on it. I haven't read much past uh, the Necromancer trilogy. I mean, uh, Nagash trilogy, and a couple of the um, the other uh, vampire count books. But I'm wondering if the magic doesn't come from the Necromancer, but more is channeled from the Necromancer and is empowered by the winds. So like it just it's set up. To make the the bones and the and the corpses a repository or a, 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 a deposit for the winds of magic to then charge them from from there, and that takes nothing else from the necromancer later. Yeah, and um, Nagash also can take power from people's blood. It's another thing that he does, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, derived but, from dark elf magic, I'm pretty sure, which is very much the right. idea of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, personal sacrifice to gain the winds of magic's power. But necromancy is kind of unique amongst that. Vampire lore magic is specifically something that's not, uh, it's not really tied to a specific wind except for the winds of death, and that kind of thing is... Uh, it's got its own sort of caveats with things like that. It's also one of the most corrupting magics because it's uh, because dark elf magic is like so close to the chaos that comes from his stuff. It's it's an odd thing, uh, yeah. but I, I feel like that balancing act kind of works because it makes it so that yes, a necromancer can be powerful. In fact, any wizard can be really powerful, but if they do chaos is a good grasp on them. And I think Nagash just got around that by saying, well, I mean, you know, he was they, can't, they can't take my soul if I don't have one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I got something to raise. So, if you have any of you have watched the Conan the Destroyer movie? I have not. Oh, like years ago? Right. Is, is that the one with James Earl Jones or the one after that? The, well, the one after that. Um, oh. The reason I, I think I've up, seen them all. Yeah, the reason I bring it up is because there's a scene where two wizards have a battle, and they're kind of like locked in like a mind kind of like duel, where both of them are concentrating really hard, and then one of them just gives out and like uh, throws his hands up in the air and kind of like collapses and and he loses and then his spell is like, uh, what what would you say? It's kind of like interrupted, and then the Ooh. other wizard wins. And I, I was just thinking like. That might be a good way to balance things like, let's say you've got a skeleton and you're commanding it to move stuff and whatever and like, you want the skeleton to lift something really heavy. Well then, if you want to do that, it's limited by the strength of the bones of the skeleton itself, but then also your own mental like, sort of, power. Fortitude. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're trying to lift something really heavy and the, the skeleton's bones can handle it, then at some point, either you win or your mind kind of snaps. That mm. might be a good way of doing it. Yeah, that'd be, a, that'd be an interesting so, uh, setback. Um, I, I, I would, I would probably say something like that. Um, 
we often think of uh, magic in these kind of scientific terms. It's like the spell is like a catalyst and magic is like it needs to get an energy from somewhere and then you it's kind of like like you're you're getting some kind of energy uh, from the wind or from geothermal sources in the ley lines and then turning them into kinetic energy and and i would like to see different paradigms um shown in games rather than just this i would like to see uh the paradigms along the lines of uh like you bringing some kind of a uh, different world into reality like like you tapping on the realm of death which is like fundamental in some way uh, and and by make by bringing that realm of death into reality you can manifest whatever magic you want to the degree that you brought this realm of death to reality so for so for example if you like let's say you, you uh, make a sacrifice of a lot of people, you know, you, you kill a lot of people, you lay them around in a in a uh, graveyard, uh, and you maybe you plant the kind of uh, plants that grow on corpses, etc., etc., uh, then maybe your spells are going to be empowered, or maybe by the virtue of that, you'll be able to cast a stronger spell rather than uh, whatever is in your uh, regular kind of um, capacity. Mm-hmm. So, so, so it was like a right. ritual rather than yeah, just a yeah. simple spell. I don't mean just a ritual. I mean like like a different paradigm, right? Not not just like like um, you using energy, but you using something more than just energy, mm. right? So for example, m- maybe um, maybe uh, you have some kind of a god who asks you like, okay, uh, to what degree? Have you brought uh, death to reality in your life? Maybe you you poisoned a well in a village, but it doesn't have to be like attacking human beings. Maybe it, it, it was like maybe you poisoned some kind of uh, a watering spring in the wilderness, and you you poisoned an entire area because of that, uh, and and you brought the realm of death into reality. And Jesus. Oh. Sorry about. Uh, I think uh, well, I think kind of, uh, druids kind of, call them blights. Right, 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 right. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's yeah, sort of like it, it is in War uh, Warcraft uh, Three, for example. You, you've got a little bit of that, uh, but I'm saying like like to the degree that you um, efficate the kind of let's say powers that you seek to control, uh, to that degree you can you know cast your spells. You can mm. uh, use them in an extraordinary way. You know? So you're you're uh, you're appeasing some higher power that's giving you more power. Well, it doesn't have to be it. you appeasing some higher power. It it can be something like sorry, it doesn't have to be like you appeasing a personal power, right? You don't need to have a relationship with a deity necessarily, as much as something like you bringing some reality into the world mm. by ordinary means. And then being able to do it by extraordinary means. Well, you know? there's a there's a very it's actually quite similar to a system that I actually wow. thought I maybe discussed, which is really interesting. Um, have any of you played the game Enderall before? Yeah, I have. No, no, I have. Not. Okay, I have. So Enderall's magic system is really interesting. Basically, the lore reason for magic in the world of Enderall, um. Is, firstly, for those that don't know, I don't know why, but Enderall is a, uh, it's a mod, it, uh, I, 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 I don't want to say it's a mod for Skyrim because it's an entirely new game. It's, it's a game using Skyrim's engine. It's fantastic. Uh, but basically, in the game, the lore of it is completely different from the normal stuff. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of like a mix between, uh, the Gothic series and the Elder Scroll series is really good, but in the lore, uh, the reason why magic works um, is not you know uh, a resource system where you use magical capabilities and then uh, mages then use them. What it is is it um, it ties to a system called the Sea of Eventualities, which, in really simple terms, is basically like multiverse theory. So. What happens is whenever you cast a spell, 
what you're doing is, is you're not just taking a material and then casting a spell. What you're doing is basically you are taking a, a reality in, in the grand multiverse where that effect is happening and then you are basically blending the realities together to make that effect happen. So in a necromancer's case, say that there is a... You, want, you see a corpse, you want to raise it. So as a mage, what you would do is you go into the sea of eventualities in your mind, and then you basically take a reality where that corpse is standing up or getting up because it's alive, and let's say corpses in whatever reality this is don't die, they get up. You then blend those worlds together, and in your world, it then gets up, and it starts doing your bidding. And that kind of system like detaches it from the very... Uh, the the resource management kind of thing as as you mentioned it, it, it detaches it from like right, the scientific right. type thing and it's 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 kind of like what you're saying where you're physically taking another realm and dragging it into your own and then allowing something to happen um, right. I think that's one of the most unique kind of magic systems that I've ever thought of before and it really works to like describe how exactly this thing can be done without relying upon just making a magical resource type of thing. Hmm. Right, right. I, well, I think regardless, a, a very great the sea idea. of eventuality... Oh, sorry. The, regardless, the sea of eventualities is a, is a terrific name. Isn't it just? <laughs> the game, yeah, I, I, I would highly recommend the game we have played it. It's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. It's basically better Skyrim. Can you can you say it again? Ender it? No. I think it's got a full title. Let me check it up. Uh, oh, I just written it down. That's all. Yeah. Ender all forgot. Ender all forgotten stories. That's it. It's free on Steam if you have Skyrim. Oh. There's another cool. interesting magic system, um, in my opinion, and that's the Dragon Age one. It's kind of like it works off dreams. Are you guys familiar with that? I am not. I have not uh, gotten into that. I played it briefly, but I. I vaguely remember there being a normal mana system in there. Yeah, there the is. A1. There is a, a normal mana system, but according to the lore, basically there's this this realm called the Fade, and normal people just go there when they're asleep, and it's where they kind of dream and stuff. And it's kind of like a realm of spirits and whatnot, but mages have like a, a real strong connection to it. And so... Um, their ability to manifest magic in the real world is based on this connection to the Fade, and it's basically like they're dreaming it into reality. So That's kind of cool. So literally making your dreams real. That's a cool idea. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I'd say I, I, I like that kind of like that symbolic um, or that... Uh, that kind of symbolic, uh, what do you call it? Um, sim the sim sympathetic symbology or something, or symbolic sympathy. You know, uh, I can't remember the name of the of the books, but the Patrick, Patrick Roth Rothfuss series, where you do something, you like you you breathe out, and you can connect that to like the wind outside, and it would also blow the wind. But. Uh, that would be an interesting system to try and describe how necromancy work, work then. Would that just be tying an action to death of some kind? Yeah, I, I was just... Yeah. Um, but Seventh was uh, was mentioning it, and I couldn't, I didn't really fully understand it until he got he got later in his explanation, but I mm. I, I, I just thought that uh, that kind of uh, association towards, or the uh, the symbolism of the act granting the, the power was... Well, just, that's uh, kind of concept. that's just quite similar concept. to uh, how real uh, world necromancy was done. Um, back in ancient Greece, um, they had temples that were dedicated to uh, different gods and different aspects of reality, and one of them obviously was death because it is how it is. Um, and the thing about necromancy in the real world was that uh, it was never about bringing things back. What it really was about was communicating with those that had already died. Well, sure, and that's so, exactly what necromancy means. Yeah, that's that, that's quite literally the in, initial term. That's what it was from. So, yeah, it, means, yeah, talk. Yeah, so um, 
for when they wanted, when uh, people wanted to uh, utilize necromancy, they basically not only did they do their standard rituals and incantations and things like that, like you do. They also did things like consume moldy food uh, and other things that were associated with death or disease, right, because that right. way they could tie themselves better to uh, to, to the idea of death. Yeah, and then by doing that, they would then gain that kind of ability to then communicate with death yep. and such. Mm. That was yeah, back when that's, people that's thought exactly what I'm what I'm talking about. Yeah, this kind of uh, ancient outlook on on this. Yeah. It was back when uh, people thought rot was a was a thing, and it wasn't just you know microbes eating your body. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure all that How mold that? helped them hallucinate their visions. Stuff. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what people think it was. <laughs> yeah. Funny thing. Um, that's actually a system that's an interesting idea of how necromancy could work. Um, tying it directly into the system of entropy. Uh, as a as a concept rather than as a process, um, how do you feel about that? Like a, a necromancy gaining its power from the idea of the end of all things. Hmm. Do you mean like depressed? <laughs> yeah. Do you mean like the idea of the destruction of all things like fuels this skeleton because its task is to further bring about that destruction? Yeah, kind of. It's like. Uh, well, the idea of entropy as a as a philosophical concept is the idea that everything dies, everything ends, and nothing can get away from that. So by that end, uh, say you wanted to utilize magic as a way to take philosophical concepts and make them manifest, you could take that idea of end and uh, the finishing of things and then utilize that as a... Uh, as a resource or as an ability to channel those ideas into a corpse. That then makes it so that it's got that uh, death angle towards it, and then that could be used for reanimation. And like you said, it could be utilized as the idea of the skeleton is being powered by the idea that it is to help bring the end of all things, and that I way mean, it could help bring everything to death. Mm. My counterpoint Just to that would be that uh, entropy by default is about things falling apart, and when you animate things, uh, you're doing the opposite. You're kind of bringing mm. them together and holding them together forcefully. Mm. Holding yeah, that's that true. And so it doesn't fall apart. Maybe it, would be, it would maybe be more appropriate then to utilize that kind of concept for like... Uh, certain spells that did things like that, like uh, death magic and such, because that would probably fit a bit better. I, I've got a point. I, I, th Sorry, I think you would, like, use a different... Uh, like, you would conjoin different concepts. So, like, animation. Uh, you could have animation of things along the lines of, like, you know, you, you animate a broom so it flies on its own, and then you unify it with death, right? Um mm. But I'm I'm not sure how would like animation uh, get its uh, energy besides souls. I guess. Well, you could even have it as it's a a corruption of say life magic. So uh, right. you have holy magic that's all about bringing things to life, helping things, healing things, right. and then you just put your own corrupted version of that. So yes, you are technically helping things. You're bringing things to life, just things that are already dead. Right. Right. Like I, I would I say. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I would go, say go necromancy isn't. Um, it's not death. It's a. Uh, it's false life. It's like corrupted life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a point to be made about the whole entropy thing. Um, if I may, just quickly, have you have any of you ever read the um the Brandon Sanderson books about? Oh, I forgot the name of it. Uh, it's his main thing. But in any case, I've forgotten the exact name. Stupidly, but. In this series of books, um, spoilers, the, one of the yeah, so. end, um, one of the big antagonists is a guy called Ruin, and he's basically like the force of entropy, and his whole thing is about like bringing about the end of all things. But the unique thing about him is that he doesn't mind using like the opposite of entropy in order to bring about more entropy. So he will actually like like construct things like um, engines of war and whatever else in order to use those things to bring about even more entropy. 
So maybe that's something okay. that could explain like what we were just talking about. Mm. I have to say, it seems funny that a lot of these, a lot of these stories and stuff have to do with you know entropy being this thing to further its goals. But the thing about entropy is that it's inevitable. I yeah. would think that some that some dark god he just doesn't care. He's like, dude, in like 14 million years, as 14 billion years, I'm gonna win. It's fine. Don't worry about it. You well, know, I, think be, I think he'd be. I think he'd be incredibly chill. Yeah, that ultimately <laughs> is though the uh, the necromancer thing, isn't it? Once they reach lichdom, it's all a matter of attrition. Because in the yeah. end, everything rots away except the things that are undead, because then they'll just keep coming back. That's kind of like a thematic thing, I suppose, that works well with the undead. It uh, it makes it seem like you might not win initially, but give it enough time, and you will win. Yeah. Just like a lot of people not understanding exactly what entropy is, but liking the idea, the metaphor of it. Hmm. Yeah. But um, if we uh, kind of move back around to like the... Uh, the actual like sources of power. I uh, I actually put a uh, made a little notepad of a uh, of some ideas for like the sources of it. I actually uh, mislabeled it the popcast. Um. So uh, we were talking about uh, the sources of power, and uh, you mentioned something like the um like the geothermal geothermic energy. I was also uh, I had written down uh, we have things like nuclear. You know, the separation of atoms could be a could be a thing. I mean, if we're still in the scientific way of it, I think if we go back to that, um, there's the the tidal. You could use it uh, somehow getting energy from tidal movement, uh, lunar movement. You know, the the moon going around, solar energy, uh, celestial energy. You know, just the spin, spinning of the galaxies. Um, we have dimensional. You know, like opening up a portal and it to like the dimension of fire where, you know, just for some reason, everything is there. Like that's where fire on the models come from. And, um, I had the last, the last two are, are more interested in actually, uh, one is just a soul. And I thought, you know, it's cool if you have like soul magic, but if the act of killing was, is the, is the catalyst to getting the magic, then, Perhaps it's the moment when the soul exits the body. You you gather that you gather that explosion of magic in and and take it and um, maybe that's your fuel source. You know, maybe it's a soul magic just re- just as it's released from the dead from the from the body of a of a recently deceased person. Um, what do you think? I, I got a point to make about one thing, kind of related to what you said, but. I think that, like, no matter what the source of the actual magic is, it manifests itself in ways that can be measured scientifically. Like, a fireball, it's giving off a kind of heat and energy, right? That can be measured exactly. in, like, physical means or whatever, like, um, sure. uh, what's, what's the like- unit for heat? Uh, Celsius. Or, like, um, yeah. like for example, a, ske- a skeleton moving its arm or whatever, that would be, like, a kilowatts or horsepower or something, right? Sure, and everything translates into, I mean, all of those are, are relative. They go into joules, they go into, you know, X amount of TNT, you know, that all, that is, that is all translatable through formula and stuff, formulae. So do you think these things should be linked? Like, a certain amount of mana will yield a certain amount of, like, kilowatts? Uh, I think that would require some kind of formula or some, a lot more math than I'm usually willing to do yeah. for my stories but would it be cool <laughs> would it be cool to do that would it i think it really would hmm. personally I, mean, I think it really would i would say um i i've seen a lot of uh, a lot of stories and worlds that kind of do this uh scientific like mindset but don't go the full way i i think that would be interesting to see it go full way um, into some some like pseudo you know counting how much mana uh, you can get from from uh, drinking magic moonlight and how that would turn into kilowatts uh, mm-hmm. of, of electricity from your uh, from your magic thunderbolt spell uh, but 
personally, I would like to see like uh, the the uh, worlds and systems and things where this is not exactly quantifiable, where yeah. where things like that are um, uh, less, let's say, uh, scientifically reliable and more about how are you changing the world, how. Uh, what kind of, you know, symbols are you using to manifest this rather than, oh, you know, with my, with my special biotics, I can generate, I, I can like transmit power at like 40% efficiency. Yeah. Well, sure. That's just like a, a fully different theme towards the, the yeah. side of the magic, you know, it's just That's not really competing. My point is, is to try to go in a different direction rather than, uh, kind of force, science into yeah. uh, into fantasy rather i would say like, like let's try to divorce science and our kind of limited 20th century mindset uh out of out of fantasy entirely mm. like we we, okay. we we go to fantasy to get away from real right. world right. ideas and, and then <laughs> we, we kind of force the real world into the fantasy into the minds of uh people who had like you know, people in the ancient or, or medieval world didn't have the kind of uh, cognitive uh, tools that, that we use in the modern day, much less that they would be like, oh, you know, if if there was, you know, uh, this kind of creature, uh, then then how did it walk on the earth, you know, or, or how <laughs> could it have enough oxygen to sustain itself? It's like, yeah, that's that's not how we thought, you know. I'd say my, my I'd say my only counter to that would be is that we do in fact have a mana bar, and it shows how much mana we've used. Here's my counter to it. So, like, I agree that it can be lame to like do that kind of thing, but the the reason why you might do it is to try and stop that whole thing we we're talking about in the beginning about you know um, a necromancer that's got endless power to just make everyone's food and stuff. You know, like if you can somehow nail it down in some kind of less arbitrary means. Like, let's say you have a ritual, right? Um, if it's producing a certain amount of power, and there's, like, a formula for that, then you can determine exactly how many souls you need to sacrifice in the ritual to make it happen. And it's kind of sure. consistent within the world itself. And I think mm -hmm. that, like, if you do it right, it doesn't have to be, like, in conflict with what Seventh is saying. But it could be like just a way of keeping things grounded to the extent that it prevents like this kind of insane industrial revolution of necromancy that has honestly been like bothering me for forever in in settings of necromancy because I haven't been able to find a good way to explain why that wouldn't happen. Well, um, in the game uh, I've been running. Uh, there is a necromantic like society fa faction and the way I balance things, if it comes to things like uh, mining or work or, uh, or farming is that the, the, like the devices they use to animate corpses are sort of science fantasy in a way. And, uh, they emit something like radiation, like magical radiation that makes, uh, makes things fall apart. Uh, makes uh, makes land infertile. Uh, it's also oh, makes so they're forced to kind of it, march it makes, from one place to another. So it makes the actual use of it poisonous, like yeah, the actual yeah, use yeah. of magic yeah. bad. Yeah. I yeah. see, like, but like, it's too the, useful the, not to use it in certain yeah. aspects. Yeah, yeah. So so it's so it's sort of like like comes with caveats. And that is I a, think that's the interesting way, rather than like me counting, oh, you know, how much my magic crystal, uh, how many kilowatts my magic crystal can generate, and and how many, you know, skeleton hours this is going to produce, right? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. I think that's more of a matter like, of perspective. Like, okay, what, what kind of problems am I producing in my world by inserting these always inter eternally running... Uh, undead, and how do I address them? Or if there 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 are these changes, let's say, then maybe you know maybe the whole world is run based on you know undead f tilting the land everywhere. Like maybe you know sometimes you can just be like, okay, how do I fix this? And sometimes you can just embrace it and be like, mm -hmm. why? You know, why not? 
too, but that would, that's also, I don't know, a setting that maybe not everyone is, you know, willing to, um, you know, run their, or play their story in or, or play their game in. And, uh, it does seem, it seems to me like it's, it's a lot more a matter of uh, a perspective on, you know, whether or not it's fun. I think there can be a lot of fun in, in the, the number game if it, if it's something, cause, I mean, the, the mere fact that something moves, I mean, is, I mean, emits, I mean, is, um, it's just, is, is connect energy, you know? Maybe, if, you know, you could say that however much energy it takes to summon a skeleton, you know, maybe that's better used, um, uh, pushing a mill or, you know, there's, there's just better, uh, you know, maybe more efficient I mean, to I mean, roll a boulder down a hill, you know, well, rather, rather well, that's, that's, than summoning that's a sure. skeleton. That's, that's kind of like what I've been saying, uh, in here is that either you can have this paradigm of like, oh, you know, uh, dwelling in this, oh, how much energy, uh, does it translate to, or just like, um, drop the idea of energy entirely, you know, like you're not in a, in a world where needs, which needs to count that. Like people have lived for over, uh, well, you know, like, like, how old is civilization? At least 10k years, I guess. Uh, people have lived at least for, you know, good, a few thousand years without, uh, knowing what energy exactly is, you know, and somehow they survived. Yeah. Uh, I, my I point is kind of, for you then, if you don't mind me asking, um, if, um, if you have a system like that, how do you prevent mm -hmm. this like industrial revolution of, of stuff? Well, well, okay. So the question is, uh, I guess, what are you willing to do? Um, and what kind of after effects does your magic have? If your magic, uh, by default, by the, the, the way it works in my game, uh, if your magic just de defertilizes the land, if it destroys the soil, then by default, the undead can't really do much if it comes to farming. But you can have other means, for example, uh, maybe the dead, uh, may maybe there's some kind of like religious, um, opposition to this, or worldview opposition, or maybe you need to do absolutely terrible things to raise those undead. Maybe you need to sacrifice infants or something. Mm. Uh, cut it out later so you don't get them on the test. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so that, yeah, that definitely um, that definitely satisfies why there wouldn't be a, you know, an industrial right. revolution. Although, in a dark enough setting, it could just be that, you know, that could sure. be in a very nice dystopia. That could be a very good dystopia. Right, right, right. that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> It's like, cool it's like, but, the, but it's um, what you're talking about, kind of how they they lived without knowing about it. Um, that is uh, that is an. It doesn't point, mean it didn't but, exist for sure, for sure. No, 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 no. I get that. Yeah, that's true. But um, it's also kind of like um, if you're playing a rolling role playing game, that's kind of like uh, the difference between character knowledge and player knowledge. The fact of the matter is, there is, uh, there is a. Um, um, there is a an equation out there that will say how much force is being put on this thing, and that's something that the author at least should know. That that is without that is not within the bounds of not within the bounds of the magic system. I got a new no. for you guys. If you don't mind. It's it's related to this. Sure. But okay. When I'm making a spell in my game, for example, I have no way of determining how much mana it should cost. It's just like um, I don't know. <laughs> I'll just write 40 in there. That feels right. And it feels really kind of like lame and just arbitrary that I've got no way of like, it's all just, it's all just made up. And there's like, I'd like the, for there to be some kind of like thing I can fall back on to like, um, keep things balanced in a way that isn't so kind of like just on my own whims. I well, don't know how that's a, it's it's kind of that's a kind of a game design question, but I actually do yeah, have an answer yeah. for this. Uh, for something like that, what you want to do is you want to take um, 
uh, whatever spell or ability it is you you have. And if it's done on a pure, if it, I take it there's no uh, there's no um, cooldowns or anything. It's only purely based on uh, the resource system. There is like a minor cooldown, but it's pretty much just so that when a player is holding down their their mouse button, it's not just like firing a million spells a second. Yeah. but it's kind of like. You know, if it'll do one, then like wait two seconds. If you're still holding it down, it'll do another one. Yeah. So for a system like that, what you want to do is you want to take each spell or ability that you've got, and you need to decide from yourself if there is a player that is to take uh, whatever spell or ability it is, and then just spam this over and over. So like, uh, let's say there someone's using a fireball. You need to determine to yourself, okay, how many fireballs should this person be able to fire in one go? So let's say uh, on a full bar, oh, they, they can run, let's say, four. So four fireballs seems uh, balanced enough because you have to obviously take into consideration the numbers on whatever spell it is you're doing and such. If you think that that... You then take the amount of times you think one player should be able to utilize that ability in a single bar... You then look at the resources that you've got for uh, how much mana or whatever it is that you've got that they have. And you then just divide that by the amount that you would say that they should be able to do. So, for example, let's say they have uh, 100 mana. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you say to yourself with the fireball example, I want them to be able to only do about four fireballs because that seems balanced due to DPS and whatever. You then take that and you divide that amount by the resource you've got so that by that factor, fireball should cost around 25 mana each. And uh, you could change that depending on the uh, different kinds of spells and stuff that you do from there, like uh, reanimation spells. You don't want them to be able to reanimate like five guys in one go, so uh, have it so that they can reanimate maybe twice on one bar and then need to recharge. A bit like how you do with uh, a cooldown system in like an MMO or something. Determine how long it should be between casts or between yeah. ability usages and then divide that based on how your resource system is utilized. Um, yeah, I was about to suggest the same thing. Basically, just walk out there and start clicking the button to say how many times do you think how many times do you want to cast a spell in one sitting? Yeah. Like how many times do you think they should be able to cast a spell in yeah. one sitting? And and of and course, it's important as well to take a look at the numbers of whatever spell you're using. So, like, yeah. if something's got high DPS, you don't want them to be able to rapid fire that because then why would yeah. they use anything else? Just use yeah. that. Like, yeah. if it's too powerful, you know. Right. And right. Uh, one of the you're kind of uh, in in a setup like that with with a PC, you're kind of forced to uh, make equations. Along the lines yeah. of like how much mana to damage am I generating? You know, so let's say you're you're hitting a single enemy with like a hundred damage for fifty mana. That's like two uh, damage for one mana. Um, but sure. if you, let's say you have a fireball which d deals uh, seventy five damage to every single enemy in its AOE, which costs uh, seventy five mana, right? It's like it would depend on how many enemies you're hitting with it to make it uh, work. And also, once you get into beta, you know, your your players will tell you that this seems a little too right. overpowered, right. or you know, right. you'll get feedback. Yeah, so it's not really you something you should really worry about. Balance isn't really something you should. Place. Yeah, you shouldn't really be worrying about balance until it's closer to be actually being played. Right. Yeah. Uh, or the... sorry, go on. Or if it's or if it's uh, just if it's your, or if it's guiding towards your vision of how you want the game to be played. Hmm. Yeah. Um, one Sorry. other thing, guys. So, mm -hmm. a, a system I've always liked, even oh. though it's maybe a bit like, I don't know, it's probably not perfect, but you know how in D&D &D the spell components? I've always liked that. I've liked that too. They never come up, though. Yeah. But, Actually, having yeah. to have the back one out of Cast Fireball. Yeah, but it's like, it's a nice limiter, and it also also describes like where the the magic power is coming from a bit in a way like if you want to cast web then you need like i don't know whatever it is silk in your backpack or whatever uh. sure it, it actually costs you know i mean if you don't have a pound of guano on you you can't cast 500 fireballs you can only cast six and then you're out of guano well, you got to go find more in, yeah uh, in reality in D, &D it, it sort of boils down to like you having a spell focus or a an ingredient pouch and the 
actual ingredients only boil down to something like flavor. Yeah, I know. But it'd be I, I think it's kind of sad, you know? It would be um, interesting if we could actually have those. Each one of those is a resource. That could be a good idea, right. Jeff. Yeah. Well, well, if you I'm, had each one of those as a resource, you'd have like as many in- ingredients, actually, like two or three times as many ingredients as they have spells. So, yeah, I mean, definitely, absolutely I mean, insane uh, to keep. Oh, it would almost be like a crafting system, you know? You have this many, you can, you can, you yeah, can yeah, build this many. Like, practically speaking, it would be, it would be unplayable. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very serious about this. It would be absolutely unplayable. Well, one fun system that can kind of work in lore with something like this is um, in, uh, in D&D, you've got uh, hags who work on not on a magic system, they work on a magical item system, where a bit like how we said, you need a physical item in order to cast a spell. But hags, how they work is instead of having spells uh, that, they, um, that they utilize from just casting a spell... They work instead on the idea of uh, they've got, say, an item that's hexed with a spell, and then they utilize that, uh, which it, it can lead to some very silly things. So, for example, one I remember a friend telling me about specifically was uh, the idea that um, they were fighting a hag, and this hag had the, uh, the shrunken head of a former lover. And because she had that former lover's head, uh, it basically meant that she was able to utilize that person's ghost because it basically was in the head because she didn't like him very much. Uh, And because of that, it makes it so that it's a system that means it's limited use because she can only throw out the head a couple number of times. Um, But it also works as a way to balance out the system uh, without it being overpowered, but giving it a weird and wacky powerful ability. Uh, and I, I think that's a fun way to balance it out, but I do think you shouldn't balance uh, a system of magic or whatever on that, on that because that can lead to uh, issues, I guess, uh, where you feel like you've got the... Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of like the potion debacle, uh, where you have like a really powerful potion in your bag, but you never use it because you never you want to say yeah. like, like all of uh, Resident Evil. Yeah. Oh, Plus, there's an <laughs> effect of potions. Like, if you've ever played Diablo and you've been a mage, and you know you chug down so many potions, well, at some point it's going to have to come out, right? You're going to have a, <laughs> you're gonna have a fire hydrant of a piss to piss out. <laughs> Right. Or could come out any other day, a couple of It's ways. fine, it's coming out in your spells. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh god, that's you cast with your dick. Yeah. <laughs> Voila, the rod of power. <laughs> uh, one thing about items, I, I dislike the idea, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I really dislike the idea about like a wizard being useless unless he's got his staff with him. Mm, yeah, see... So y- I'm I'm of two minds of that because yes I do think that they should definitely uh, not just be tied to their staff and should you know have some kind of ability, have. but I I I like the idea of staffs being used as focuses of power. Yeah, I so, think they should make their power more. Fin- they should give them more control or finesse or power mm. to do something that they can already do. I I agree. I don't like the idea that they're they're useless without their one item or their spell book or their wand or their ring mm. or whatever. Yeah. I agree. Because I mean, I, I think that the notion of something like um I I would say that um Colin well how should I say like like um keeping all of your powers in a single item would be indeed kind of boring. But I do <laughs> believe <laughs> right. Um but I do. I mean, it's uh, like like. Would you would you play a Sauron without the ring? Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, well, the Necromancer of Dolgador always sounded interesting. But, right. Yeah. I'd rather but, play as a but, lizard. But okay. the, the, my point is that um, it um, without this kind of mechanicity, uh, I. I 
would dislike the notion of like a wizard just casting with thoughts because uh like human thoughts can wander and you suddenly you know you suddenly uh think about something wrong or something like that uh, or or focus on the wrong thing and you fry it or something like that Mm. Or, or that. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a hilarious notion, uh, not necessarily a, a problem in, in games. But I, I personally, I dislike the notion of wizard casting just with our minds. I, I prefer to have a grounding because it's it makes it more interesting. You know, like yeah. you're not just um, imposing some kind of external um, thing. You're not just manifesting some some kind of uh, mechanics from uh from the game system into the game world it's more like you're you're actually doing something physical right you're 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 you need I like somatic know, components basic in sacrificial, yeah you need this basic sacrificial uh dagger or something like that you know like like you need to to actually do something physical yeah. in order to to cast the spell I, I feel like i feel like that's much better than just like you know? psionics you know, seven. I was just thinking just now. Um, mm-hmm. We're kind of like interesting examples because we're both telling stories, but we're by the medium that we choose to tell them is like forcing us to come at it from a different angle. Like, yeah, because you have like the the tabletop thing, you're kind yeah. of like very open ended with what you can do. But when I'm right. making my game. I'm literally forced to write some kind of formula. Like every oh, yeah, yeah. spell sure. is like coming back to like a, a script with like values and integers and timers and um, resources. Mm, such as just, I guess the kind of systems you have to do when you're dealing with right. game design. But yeah. the good thing is even with, uh, even with game design, you can still include the, in, like the stuff in the lore and then just have it as represented as a mana bar. Like the the thing I mentioned about the sea of eventualities in Enderol, that's like it's all system and it's all very interesting, but it is still using a mana bar. It's just going on the idea that oh, you only have so much, you know, physical capability of pulling things from the sea of eventualities, and that's represented by it's your mana bar, basically. The sea juice, yeah. yeah. What do you guys think about mana? I kind of dislike it. I don't know, it's just... I was I... actually uh, thinking of, uh, of a... I don't know if there's a mana or a bar, but uh, when you started uh, telling me about your game, Chip, uh, I started uh, you know, just naturally deciding or thinking about what I would do, and I had started this idea about this druid, and I I thought of myself, first of all, the, the first thing I, I, uh, I looked at was this thing in... Uh, um, Unreal, and that taught you how to make a mana bar. That was literally the first thing I ever learned to make in Unreal. But I realized I really didn't like mana bars, so I was wondering, like, it'd be kind of neat if there was no literal bar and no value, but yeah. maybe like some like creeping redness or greenness coming out from the or along the sides, like like you'd see in like some um in some you get like damaged when you're too damaged or something. You, it like gets all dark and red or something, and you mm-hmm. heal, it clears up. I'm wondering if you have something if I could do that with a with a mana thing. Yeah, but uh, like maybe there's some interesting alternatives out there. Like um, the the first alternative I was exposed to was the D and D way, where you've got spell slots, which is interesting, but it's another flawed kind of thing. But there's yeah, also st- stuff slots. like corruption, like in mm. Conan, where the more magic you cast. Um, the more corrupt you get, which manifests itself in like your ability scores being halved. Like you, you run slower. You have less health, less stamina, less this and that. And the only way to uh, recover from that is to stop using magic for a while and allow yourself to regenerate because the magic. I, I like that. I think this is great. Maybe you could uh, add some other ways to uh, remove corruption, like for example, slitting your wrist, and then the the corrupted blood flows out of you, and mm. with it the corruption. Yeah. So sacrifice health for. Right. Yeah, yeah. You sacrifice health and and reduce uh, quickly uh, a bunch of corruption, and then you mm. can cast again. If you wanted to go away from uh, resource bars and stuff, uh, you could also have this represented uh, on character, a bit like you, how you said with corruption and Conan and how that's utilized. 
But one thing that um, I think is actually a really good example of uh, getting rid of bars and stuff to make it more, I guess, immersive. Um, I don't know if you've ever played the horror series Dead Space, but in that, the character's the health... Backpack. Yeah, a character's backpack health is, so is represented by a, a little spinal tube thing that's attached to him. And the less health he has, the less lighting that's available on that back tube. And that's a way to sort of demonstrate the the amount of resources that a character has without having a resource bar available. It makes yeah. sense in-universe, and it also makes sense by not cluttering up the screen, which is good because it's a horror game, so you want that to be the case. Right. Yeah, because the thing is, it's a, it's a game. It has, to be, it has to be noticeable. It has to be recognizable. Yeah. And it'd be really hard if it's just your character just started changing a few, you know, subtler crazy, um, you know, uh, shades of gray or gr- got vines. Cause you don't look at, cause in this instance, we're not looking at the character's face. We're looking at the character's back and we're responding to enemies, jumping around, repositioning. There's a lot of stuff that minor bar is, is actually ex- very expedient in which something is, you know, uh, that has, uh, like a lot of uh, fast twitch, you know, like, uh, um, uh, things you got to, you know, a high octane kind of battle, you know. So it's it's really easy to to keep that, uh, keep it in your head. You know, you can see exactly how much you have and what you do. You'd have to really be really clever if you're going to be able to make something like that. That's not a that's not a bar mm. that doesn't uh, that that can that can that can accurately represent what is happening without yeah. um, breaking the, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. it's it's ultimately a thing that you have to balance between uh, player sort of um, player comfort and player knowledge that's being given to them and having immersion. Because uh, an example that I think is a bad example is the Call of Duty series. In that game, it's, it's uh, your health is represented by the red wiggly lines are at the side, but you have no indication as to how damaged you are or how close you are to death. And I feel like that goes against it because it means that you don't really understand what's going on until you're at the very last moment, in which case your vision's extremely blurred. Uh, so, like, you can't tell you're at half health or you can't tell you're at uh, quarter health. In that case, you need to move yeah. away. You're just on death's door. Your vision's blurred and red squiggly lines are all around you. And I feel like what? that's that's not... A, it gets rid of UI elements, so you don't have like a health bar, but it also means that the player doesn't have enough knowledge to understand the situation that they're in, and that which can be thematic in a single player in a single player experience, but in a a competitive multiplayer battle, that yeah. kind of thing is a complete liability. Mm-hmm. I mean, it'd be completely thematic in a in a regular game because you get shot in in war, you you don't get multiple shots. I yeah, mean, usually you don't get multiple shots, but if you know, so you everything is about not being hit while mm-hmm. still trying to hit. But in a multiplayer game, it's about killing the opponent regardless of what happens to you. And mm-hmm. you know, there, there are different priorities. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, finding a way to ad- adequately display that and convey that information to the player would be um, a very challenging thing to do. But you know, it could yeah. be done in different ways. Also, um, a bit of a side a tangent. Going back to the uh, the idea of um, staffs and other things being used as ways to f- focus your magics. One idea I quite like is the idea that if you're using magic as a mage or something, um, if you don't have a staff or a wand or whatever, the magic that you cast is not... Uh, you can't concentrate it into a location. So... Uh, as an example, say you've got a lightning spell. If you cast a lightning spell, like, like let's say it doesn't, it's not affected by whatever items you've got, you can still cast it. If you cast a lightning spell, you can't just cast out your hands and it will fly in a direction where you want it to go, like force lightning. It will just start flaring everywhere around you, and because <laughs> you can't, because you can't concentrate it. But it's say if you've got a, but say if you've got a staff. The magic literally works like a laser pointer at that point, where the staff is the laser pointer, allowing you to focus the magic through that staff and then point it in a direction you want to go, and it will go in that direction. Because that way you are able to cast spells still, but you're able to concentrate it in a way. And like, say you are doing it in a reanimation sense, uh, if you cast a reanimation spell, 
you won't necessarily reanimate the corpse that you've got in front of you. It might flare off somewhere, and it might even fizzle out and miss, because, let's say, it fires off into the sky, and you've not resurrected anything. But if you've or you just a- got back some bugs. Or you yeah. just got back some bugs. Uh. I got a great example of this. That's a great point. It's a fantastic point. Yep. Yeah, I got a good example of this in a book, actually. Uh, there's the Sabriel books. I don't know if you know them. But basically, uh-huh. it's about necromancers that use sound to control dead. And uh, usually, like, it has the effect like dismissing them or turning them or something like that. But if they have these sets of bells, right? And, like, they ring the bell that makes a certain tone or, or whatever, frequency, sound stuff. And it it has this effect on the undead. But if they're without their bells, they can actually use, like... Their, their vo- the voice box and stuff to reduce the note but obviously it's of an inferior quality because the bell is like a very precise instrument to make the exact tone sure. and if they get it wrong then it can have disastrous effects like uh, you know the wrong tone can kill you for example or have the opposite effect of what you want so or give you the brown note <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's like a, a cool example of items being used in a way that I approve of. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's definitely a very unique system. You'd have to fear any like opera singer, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah imagine they can hit were, those notes perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if you're just singing and like you're having all this effect in the graveyard. Like... <laughs> <laughs> it's like a disco. Crypt of the Necro Dance is an actual <laughs> example of that. <laughs> You're just singing your beautiful hymn in the choir outside. The, the bones are just popping out of this out of the grave. <laughs> <laughs> I quite literally. I think that's quite literally what um, Ka- uh, Silostra Dyerfin does in Warhammer because she's she was an opera singer who died and she came back as a ghost and is resurrecting people through song. I'm pretty sure that is exactly what she does. Oh. <laughs> You know, this is a uh, question. She's, uh, she's not from the lore, actually. She's from... She was created for the game, I believe. Yeah. You know, I've actually got a question for 7th, because for, to me it sounds like this kind of using tones or bells or whatever with the, the undead, it seems like something that would come from, like, our actual real-life folklore. Do you know anything about that? Oh, for whom the bell tolls. Um, uh, yeah, I have exactly. some ideas uh, about... For whom for example, the bell tolls... Uh, you have the bells used by the Buddhists uh, for all kinds of purposes. They believed that certain frequencies can have certain purposes. Like uh, I, I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to say something stupid, but but uh, essentially things like aligning the chakras, things like putting the the spirits to sleep, mm-hmm. etc., etc. Um, you have some similar ideas in. Um, in uh, the the uh, in the the Catholic churches where you have well it's same with Orthodox churches where you have the bells uh, that have this kind of um, like 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 they're meant to uh, to gather communities together they're meant to uh, to send uh, evil spirits reeling stuff like that uh, and most notably. Uh, the the bell tolling uh, is usually the bell that was attached to corpse carts, uh, especially in times of the plague. Uh, Bring so out your that, dead. Yeah. Bring out your and dead. The, I'm not the, dead. Uh, <laughs> the lepers right. have had to wear some kind of uh, bells or something like that to make sure people didn't approach them. Uh, it's the same with corpse carts. Is that you know. Uh, you had to uh, you had to kind of kind of uh, first alarm people not to get too close, but also to uh, to bring out their corpses so that these corpses would get ridden off. Ooh. Really, I'm feeling much better. <laughs> you, you have you have all kinds of, of things that would um, say that the bells would uh, signify and, and could be used for. So for sure, you could you could do all kinds of things. Uh, now, would Ocarina of Time uh, style, you know, uh, spellcasting be viable in a multiplayer 
Uh, <laughs> you know, RTS? I don't know. Uh, probably not. <laughs> Bring out your Guitar Hero controller. Right. To take it. That's a <laughs> sick as hell idea. I'm like, that you, need, you need a riff on this little bell to, uh, <laughs> to raise your dead, you know? <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> Oh, there's um. What's there's the, a what's the uh, what was the game? What was the game that had you do that? There was a game that did that. Um, oh, I don't it was know. a game that I mean, did that. What was it called? It was that. Um, oh, excuse me. Sure. No problem. Uh, let, me, let me look it up. Oh, it's Brutal Legend. It's Brutal oh, Legend. Oh, Brutal Legend. Oh, yes, yeah, right. Brutal Legend's awesome. It literally had you do that. It literally. It, it's, it's not bad. It's not a stupid idea. I think. I love yeah, Brutal Legend. What about? He fucking rocked. Sorry. <laughs> right. Demontized. Um, one thing that I would say as well is, like, uh, the sound system. There's actually um, there's actually a system in the Elder Scrolls that utilizes this. Um, have either of you ever heard of the thing called tonal architecture? Oh, is it, like, um, in cathedrals and stuff? Not quite. Or so, is it the, the sand thing on the, on the vibrating board? No, so okay. in the Elder Scrolls, there is okay. Right, this is going to require some deep lore, so bear with me. Um, in the uh, in the Elder Scrolls, uh, Michael Kirk pride on drugs. Let's go. So, the Elder Scrolls universe is a song. Okay, it is it is a uh, uh, a song of life that is being dreamed up by a dreamer god. That is that is the actual Elder Scrolls universe and how it works. This this world's song has notes and has beats and has a, a flow, and that is how the world just functions. Now, tonal architecture is having the ability to recognize the the song of reality and changing it or making notes and sounds to alter reality to your wants and needs. Now, Seems like something you learn in that that, that uh, library dome. <laughs> a library dimension. Yes. Well, see, here's the thing. This was something that was used by the Dwemer, the dwarves of the Elder Scrolls universe. Do you ever wonder how uh, they have massive underground cities and caverns? They didn't dig that. They used tonal architecture. Because you see, they were very smart and thought to them and, and basically looked beyond the gods. They looked to add to the idea of reality itself and what it was and how they could utilize it. And when they did, they found out that tonal architecture was well, they found out about the, the song of reality first. And then they thought of the idea, but what if we change the notes? That's where tonal architecture came in. So they used sound devices that could change reality. And by doing that, they could then bend the world to their whim in ways that would go against the flow of the natural world. So, for example, in creating their massive underground caverns and cities, they used tonal architecture to quite literally delete the ground where it was, rather than dig it out. And by doing I'm that... Starting they, to, they I'm starting to see it. how they got themselves wiped out. Yeah, well, so, yeah. You know... That, that's, that's where that comes about. So, um... <laughs> Do you know how um, the the lore of how the Dwemer disappeared? Like, what what was the moment that caused it? I, I, I just know that he did. That they were like one thing about the Elder Scrolls is like when oh, you get right. into the lore, it is one trippy fucking world, man. As as I said, the lead writer Michael Kirk, Michael Kirk right, was on a lot literally. of drugs. <laughs> they are only trippy. Um. So. Basically, what happened was, uh, to make a lot of lore short, uh, dwarves and El dark elves very upset with each other, fighting over stuff. At the very crux of this, um, the, the Dwemer had an idea. They wanted to create a god, and specifically, they wanted to ascend to the power of gods. So they created something called the Nemidium. It's a giant brass golem that's as big as a mountain, and they put it inside a red mountain. This... Um, this was uh, a, a thing that was powered by a, a literal heart of God, the heart of Lorcan. Mm -hmm. um, and this powerful artifact was essentially to be the engine that they would utilize in order to activate it. And they learned and utilized tonal architecture by striking the heart. 
And by striking the heart in certain ways, they were able to utilize tonal architecture in order to do their things. And they did this through free artifacts uh, called Sunder, Keening, and Wraithguard, which are a, uh, a gauntlet, a dagger, and a hammer. And they literally played the heart like a weird drum. So they used the hammer to strike the heart to make tonal noises. They used the dagger to get this. They used the dagger to quite to cut the notes that were coming out of the heart to then change how the tonal architecture worked. And Wraithguard was the gauntlet used to be able to wield these artifacts because otherwise you'd die if you used them without holding onto Wraithguard. So, Hi. final battle. Uh, they're about to be killed by the elves. The head engineer, Kagranak, panics. He takes the hammer, slams it into the heart, hoping that this will be the thing that they can utilize to become a god. Something happens. Something goes wrong. All the dwarves immediately disappear. So, whatever kind of tonal architecture they used at that point, it caused some kind of effect which deleted the dwarves. Now, there's a whole sort of uh, debate as to what happened exactly. There's some that saying they used tonal architecture to accidentally delete themselves from existence. There's some saying that they utilized it to uh, become godlike, and so they disappeared into the Aetherius, the realm of gods. There's even some that say that they, uh, they all merged into the literal skin of their giant brass god, and thus technically became gods. It's, uh, it's all up for interpretation, but uh, yeah, d- d- tonal architecture is very much uh, a thing that is uh, used to change the world as it was. And absolutely, if you knew how to, you could use that to make massive undead armies, um, if you're mad enough. It's, it's like the music of creation in uh, yeah. Warhammer. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Uh, uh, it, music it, of- I like the idea of tapping into the Song of the Spheres, right? Uh, the Song well, of the Spheres... Also- uh, l- let me f- explain that yeah. real quick. Uh, Song of the Spheres is the idea that uh, there's some like giant invisible mechanism behind everything that moves every single planet, uh, star, comet, etc., etc. And uh, we don't hear it because we got used to it, because we hear it from birth. Uh, so we tune it out. Mm-hmm. So people who kind of unlock it can hear the grinding of the gears of that mechanism, and by replicating this grinding of the gears, you can create and or destroy things. Very cool. I think uh, um, Tolkien's world is also created by song. Yeah, I think Alu, so, right? right. Alu Iluvatar and his ma and the Valar, and then uh, Melkor was started to want to make his own part, and of course that was always Iluvatar's plan, so it all became just the way he wanted, anyways. I was just thinking about, like, the research and development pro- process on that bell stuff, like, for the Dwemer. Like, can you imagine, like, the trial and error process? Like, I know, right? <laughs> we're bang here. Whoops. My grandma's gone. Yeah. <laughs> you never had a grandma. Yeah. What? <laughs> um, another You're thing, talking about reality, man. Yeah. Jesus. Another thing, guys, is in Warhammer, like, on the topic of bells and stuff... The unholy lodestone. I, I like that. It's pretty cool. Oh right? yes. And what, how does that, that work? That they they ring it thing. and it like reanimates the dead and heals them and stuff. That kind of thing. Something I thought like it just had a big lump of lo- of 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 what's it called the the, the bad stone that the rats love. Warp stone. Oh. Warp stone. I what? thought it just had a bunch of that in the back of the cart. Maybe there's I'm wrong. A, I don't there's know. a bell on it too. On on one of them, there's like the bell fire cart. And then there's the, the Unholy Lodestone, and at least in the game, the Unholy Lodestone has, like, a bell on, on the cart, I think. Do you know, James? Well, the Lodestone is the, the clapper on the bell. It's the part that slams the bell. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. the uh, so cool. the, be- the bells in Warhammer are very tied to the Skaven uh, because of their, their god, um, who's very much... Uh, all about, you know, uh, bells and the tolling of bells and the end of reality and all that jazz. So I'm guessing that's where that ties into it. Uh, but yeah, I'm I've not actually got all the books. I probably should read them all. <laughs> Black Coach, Bud Knight, Skeletal Steve. You guys go ahead. I'll look at this. 
Yeah. No. Um, you know, there's some weird similarities between the the vampire counts and the Skaven in that way. Like, both of them use bells like that. Yeah, I think it's uh, maybe like a, a chaos influenced thing. Mm. Uh, I mean, the great horned rat, which is their god, is like it's just, it's just kind of his thing. Uh, to do that um, but I guess it's very much up to the interpretation of what you'd consider magic is utilised for in that way uh, because I mean hell winds of magic is a thing and that's a confusing matter in its own own respect yeah mm, yeah. alright guys uh, we're approaching the one hour and 30 minute mark do it, should we start wrapping it up any closing points or anything like that uh, I guess my only closing point would be that uh, I think that uh, magic systems should be not afraid to try out new things and try out new ideas. Because, hell, if something like the Sea of Eventualities can be a thing, then I'm sure a million other different interesting systems can be made up. Yeah. yeah I guess it's just going to be a matter of preference whether you... I mean, it, it is going to have to be coded, so there's going to have to be some kind of... Um, I was going to do some kind of uh, formula we're going to have to come up with. but uh... So on, on my end, as my uh, closing statement, I would advise people who aren't making things for the PC in particular to try uh, looking at their created world slightly differently, to try to engage uh, with paradigms that aren't just about scientific uh, energy calculation, but more about, you know, what sort of reality are you engaging with? What sort of symbolism are you engaging with? And how it manifests itself in your world? And what does it mean for your world? And what sort of implications does your magic have? Yeah, I, I really like right. the symbolism thing. Like, that's part of why I like the bells. Yeah, it's cool. Um, I guess for me, my closing statement is I'd like to look into the whole, like, um, alternatives to mana because mana is just like, it's something that everyone understands, but it's, it's kind of lame in my opinion. It's, it's just a bar that goes up and down and you can like refill it, but beyond that, it doesn't have much like meaning. I, I much prefer the idea of the corruption thing from Conan, but there needs to be some kind of way to implement it that doesn't... First of all, that doesn't suck. And the second is, like, fun. And Definitely, yeah. I would suggest, uh, um, uh, like, unlimited magic system, but have it damaging you if you go too far. I think that kind of system would be a very interesting and fun alternative. Yeah. I, I also really yeah. like blood magic, because, first of all, it's cool. Second, it's, like, there's this kind of, like danger of the player using it like they, they've always got in the back of their mind like if I draw too much magic I'm going to die yeah exactly so maybe I'll just go yeah. full blood mage that could work it might yeah. be a good idea what do you think about that 7th <laughs> which, which part do you mean the, the blood magic idea like basically um, life force being the fuel for, for your magic I think it's a cool idea but it's just a multi-purpose mana bar I, I thought yeah. the corruption uh, thing that you can uh, like let end up out by dropping some blood is somewhat more interesting yeah I agree yeah. I also would suggest if you want to look into a system that like lets you use as much as you want but has a downside, look at the um, look at the Fallout series and how Fallout Four specifically utilizes radiation. In that game, um, certain abilities when you are radiated make you stronger and give you abilities, but your health, your maximum health, gets lower and lower as you get more radiation. So it could be similar in that respect that. You could give a mage or a necromancer as much power as they want and are able to spam as much as they want. But as they do so, their health gets lower and lower and lower. But not like damaging them; like they'll cut their health will come back up. It's just that the maximum health they have gets lower. So yeah. the more spells they use makes means they're really powerful, but it also makes them 
far, far more likely to get one shot if they are not careful. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was thinking about how you might display, like, uh, just a corruption. I, I, I do really like that idea of the, of the, uh, the health bar going down or the maximum health going down. But, uh, maybe a way to display, uh, corruption would be thing to have maybe like this, um, dripping black or red aura that just kind of falls off the character the more mm. corrupt they are. Yeah. yeah. It could also like, manifest in stuff like horns growing or something like that. Yeah. That's like the fable rouse, right? Right? Like you guys. Play yeah. 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 I remember. That's good. But yeah. uh, that's, that's like slow and accumulative. I mean, you could be doing that for, for, I mean, that, that doesn't affect you in combat whatsoever. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, in, in this system, it'd be more of a dynamic thing. But yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. That was an awesome podcast, I think. No problem. Yeah, that was fun. All right. I'll catch you all on the yep, next one. Likewise. Thanks See you. Have a good one. Bye bye. <laughs>